Okay, everybody, it's 8.30 p.m. here on the East Coast, and as always, we'll go ahead and get our call started on time. My name is Waboy Gadaru, and I am a Citizen Empowerment Coordinator here at American Promise, and I want to give a really big thank you to all of you tuning into this call tonight, or maybe you're listening to the recording afterwards. Either way, you're stepping up to save our democracy, so thank you. Now, the purpose of this call is to inspire you about the work we're doing together to overturn Citizens United and get big money out of politics. And it's also to inspire you to come to the National Citizen Leadership Conference, or NCLC, and Lobby Day from June 22nd to the 25th in Washington, D.C., and begin the training process for a super impactful Lobby Day. This is the first in a series of calls all geared around having the most dynamic and exciting lobby day possible. Each call is going to build off the last, so we're really excited to have the first one tonight. In just a minute, we're going to hear from author Francis Moore LePay, who co-authored with Adam Eichstein of Daring Democracy, Igniting Power, Meaning, and Connection for the America We Want. And as she's talking, be thinking of questions you'd like, to answer, you'd like for her to answer. Um, and to do that, I will let you know in just a moment. Then we're going to have an overview of the NCLC as a whole and talk specifically about Lobby Day. And then we're going to have some time for question and answer. Then we're actually going to hear from two incredible American Promise Association leaders, Laura Nittmeyer and Joan DeVore, who are going to share about their APA's work and how they are getting ready for Lobby Day. Laura was actually at the first NCLC in 2016, and Joan and her group have already had three meetings with members of Congress scheduled for Lobby Day on June 25th. And then finally, we'll be having an overview of the training and coaching calls we'll provide in May, June, and leading up to the conference to make sure that the conference is as effective and super powerful. Now, before I pass it over to Jeff Clements, I wanted to share this quote actually from our guest, Francis Moore LePay, who wrote, hope is not what we find in evidence, it is what we become in action. And let me repeat that with one addition that Francis Moore LePay made herself in an interview with the Center for Equal Literacy. And she said, hope is not what we find in evidence, it is what we become in action together in community. Now, everyone on this call, whether it's your first time getting into action around the 28th Amendment to overturn Citizens United, or it's your 100th time, everyone is creating hope, and that's such an important and powerful thing. And working with all of you every day, um, I feel super hopeful. And now I'm going to pass it over to Jeff Clements, who is the American Promise founder and president, and I know he feels the same way. Hi, Jeff. Hi, my boy. How are you? Doing good. Great, great. Hey, it's uh, such an honor to be with everyone on the call again tonight. Uh, Sam Daly Harris, good to hear your voice, and I'm thrilled to welcome our special guest tonight, Frances Moore LePay. And uh, you know, uh, Frankie, as she's known to her many, many friends uh, in the, the democracy movement and beyond, um, <clears throat> is just a, a hero to so many of us. She spoke at our National Citizen Leadership Conference in 2016, and we're just delighted she's going to be back again this June on, uh, at our National Citizen Leadership Conference. She is known around the world as the uh, founder of the Small Planet Institute and the author of the award-winning, best-selling uh, Diet for a Small Planet, a classic, as well as 19 other books uh, involving uh, and regarding food and democracy and uh, really no understatement to say humanity. Uh, her latest book, uh, which everyone has to read uh, with Adam Eichen, is called Daring Democracy, Igniting Power, Meaning, and Connection for the America We Want. Uh, Frank is the co-founder of three national organizations that explore the roots of hunger, poverty, and environmental crisis, as well as solutions now emerging worldwide for what she calls living democracy. She speaks of empowerment, about turning cynicism into action, into hope, and it's just the type of thinking that we need so much in our work to reclaim our American democracy. And we couldn't be happier to have her on the call today. And 
Frank, just before I turn it over to you, uh, let me just give you some idea of some of the people on the call. Uh, in the second half of the call, we're going to hear from my friend Laura Nittmeyer, who was at the first National Citizen Leadership Conference in 2016. And as we say, brought the conference home with her to start an amazing American Promise Association in her community in Montclair, New Jersey, centered around breaking down our partisan divide to rally around the common goal of achieving this constitutional amendment to get big money out of politics and people uh, back into politics and represented fairly in those politics. We'll also hear from Joan DeVore, another American Promise member, a co-leader of a great group American Promise Association in Tri-County, New Jersey, who's leading by example. And her group's already scheduled three meetings with members of Congress for the Citizen Lobby Day we're going to have as part of the conference in June. So that's the kind of folks on the call today. And with that, it's my great pleasure and, and true honor to turn it over to you, Francis Moore LePay. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. I'm honored to be involved and in, to just share with you some of the thoughts and feelings that motivate my life and help me so much. And uh, I just want to thank you for asking me to share. And I want to start by um, first complimenting you, going to the core of our crisis and enabling people, all the people involved with you, to really experience what I see as the essence of our humanity and the essence of democracy. And what I mean by that is I think the, the deeply underappreciated need for each of us to have a sense of agency that is power, that we have a voice, and a sense of meaning in our lives, and a sense of con connection with others. And American Promise, I, I see that you attend to all of those deepest needs that we have and help people to find a way to experience the fulfillment of those needs which is human dignity itself. You know, so I sort of, myself, I think that human dignity is the very essence of what democracy means to me. And um, so I, I uh, want to talk also about what is your power as I perceive it. I mean, I I'm, I'm, hope I don't sound like I know it all here. I just, but I, if I, as I have experienced it or have, as I imagine that you are experiencing it because power is one of those words that often we're uncomfortable talking about. And I mean power in the best sense in the origin from Latin power comes from the word posse. And it just means to be able, our capacity to act and our capacity to make a difference, to have this meaning that I just mentioned. And so I am so impressed with you all um, and I want to compliment you and, and affirm the kind of power that I want you to appreciate you that you have, and that is that we we often think that it's only the big steps and the big outcomes that come from our work, but I just want to underscore that I believe that every act that you do for this essential cause that, that is the basis of solving every other problem we have, that is democracy itself, that somebody is watching you, somebody is observing, and we are all social mimics. And you'll never know how many people, the choices that you are making to step up and to stand up, how many people are watching you, and how many people are thinking, oh, yeah, maybe maybe I could do something I didn't think I could do. And I, I want to encourage you that expressing your fear or sharing your self-doubt and doing it anyway that is what people can be inspired by as well. I think that, um, you know, when when people see others engaged in something they care so deeply about, uh, it's often that feeling when you observe it, you want that. You want that thrill that can only come as you're taking risks of what you truly believe in. And so I believe strongly that the ripples of your actions are beyond anything you will ever know. And I myself had a taste of, you know, as you look forward to lobby day, um, I just, when I was at um, the results conference the day before um, their lobby day, and I honestly, I've never <laughs> been around people so uh, energized and so happy. 
uh, looking forward to this next day where they were going to go and make their case directly to the people that work for us, right, our legislators. And so I really compliment you on taking that step. And um, just that I just want to share with you a moment uh, in terms of that theme of they work for us. Uh, I participated in Democracy Spring, uh, marching from Philadelphia to Washington. And there was a moment that I can, I sense that you could probably imagine this moment where we were walking into the Capitol and we were chanting, whose democracy, our democracy, whose democracy, our democracy. We were marching for basic democracy reforms and the Capitol Dome came into focus as we were chanting. And I started crying and I realized that my brain was reorganizing. I could feel the synapses kind of popping because I realized that, oh, yes, yes, those they work for me. It is mine. And therefore, it's in my responsibilities that my power lies. And that, I think, is another message here that people often think of democracy as a duty. It is our power. Uh, this is our responsibility. And citizenship is power in that sense. So I just really want to compliment you, encourage you, tell you that I believe you're having even more effect than you think. And I just want to close on the way Adam Eichen and I close Daring Democracy. It's on the theme of courage. And we end saying a pretty dramatic statement, I guess, to me. It, it, uh, we end up saying in such a time as we are alive that the opposite of evil is no longer goodness. The opposite of evil is courage because goodness without courageous action is not good enough in this time. And I really strongly believe that your actions are courageous and contagious. So you are spreading even more than you can imagine. And I honor you for it. Thank you so much for what you're doing. Oh, well, Frankie, thank you so much. Uh, in inspiring as always. And uh, just uh, so grateful for all your work and proud uh, to all of us at American Promise, proud to be a part of the democracy movement that you describe. Uh, you know, in, in your book, if I could kick off maybe the first question before passing it back to a boy to lead uh, everyone on the call and, and weighing in and asking Frankie anything. or um, I, I want to um, follow up on one of your ideas, and you describe it in, in Daring Democracy, your book, as the following, and I'm quoting you, there is a rewarding even exhilarating role for each of us to play in making democracy real. A bipartisan democracy movement is emerging, you say. It's not about dutiful do-gooding. Instead, it meets deep emotional needs. And maybe it's even what our founders mean by our right to the pursuit of happiness. And it's a beautiful statement. And I'm wondering if, as as you've seen in Citizen Lobby Day before, and as you see how American Promise members are helping to launch American Promise associations in the communities or training for Lobby Day, uh, or even taking the time out on a, in a, after a busy work day to get on a call like this, um, your, your message that this is courage and what we need is, 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 is inspiring and powerful but I'm struck by your point that it is also a pursuit of happiness and that we are building something not just uh, courageous and necessary, which it is, but something that can actually bring community and happiness in this hard work that we do together. I, I wonder if you could say a little bit more about that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I will be happy to. Adam and I describe our experience. We talk for hours and hours about, you know, what happened to us as a result of stepping up and, Democracy Spring, and we ended up calling it the thrill of democracy, and we we identified three shifts that were profound for us, and this, uh, the pursuit of happiness, I want to bring it back to that, um, and one of them, and I'm sure, you know, you many of you will identify with this, is what happens when you bond with strangers, people you would meet, you would never meet otherwise, you bond with people because of your common commitments to this beautiful, noble cause of democracy. And when you do that, you know, our, our, we have a plague of loneliness in this country. 
And I found that meeting, you know, an Iraq veteran, an ex-banker, a teenager, you know, all the different kinds of people I met that I probably not had run into, except that we cared about democracy. And so that that unity, that since I'm not so alone, is part of the thrill of democracy. We also described it as uh, this, I've already mentioned, the, the civil courage. There's nothing more thrilling than doing something you thought you could not do and realizing, oh, 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 you know, maybe there's the next thing. And so I have a little cheesy trick that um, I, I uh, came to me some time ago because I think of myself as always trying to f- reframe the negative. Well, I used to when my, I, I'm, I'm really nervous um, when I say ask a question that I know that I'm going to be, mm, you know, out of step with in my peer group or whatever. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of timid and, I discover, you know, my heart starts to pound in my chest. And so I have reframed that, my inner applause. And so I encourage you uh, that these signs of, you know, whatever your your fear trigger, you know, minus the pounding heart, but experience that as a thrill that, oh, yes, my inner applause is saying I'm exactly where I should be doing what I should be doing. And my body is telling me that I'm taking a risk. Glorious applause. So that that is another part. And then the third part of this thrill of democracy that Adam and I identified in ourselves is the shift from victim. Uh, and I know, you know, to owner of democ- democracy, that it's so easy to feel so voiceless. And as you're working together, as you are, you know, that, that sense of taking ownership is itself thrilling. And moving out of the out of despair, which no one wants to be in. So that that's how we try to very much in daring democracy to reframe our our work for democracy is what everybody is yearning for, but few people, unfortunately yet, but more and more people through the democracy movement are realizing the these profound rewards. And so that's that's the um that's the the essence of it, and that as people see that in you, as I was mentioning earlier, I I think you know I say oh I want some of that you know because every so many people feel so overwhelmed and isolated, and you're showing another way of being in the world, and it's powerful. And I I, I just end on courage with one more thought, and that is, I say to myself if I want to become more courage more courageous, I want to hang out with courage. So Find people, find people, bring the, and and seek them out. People who are doing things more courageous than you feel you could, and believe me, that will begin to rub off. I I really believe that we are social mimics, and you'll absorb that greater courage as you surround yourself with people acting on their principles in a way that you want to do more and more powerfully. So. I hope that answers your question, <laughs> but uh, the thrill of democracy is is the key um, for me. Thank you. Uh, that's fantastic, Frankie. Thank you. And we are uh, emboldened by hanging out with you. So hang out a little longer with us, and we'll open okay. up the phone lines. Uh, well, boy, we'll tell everyone how to do that, and I encourage folks to ask a question or share a story of uh, of your own uh, trepidations and courage as you as you wade into this work, uh, and Waboy will tell us how to do that. Back to you, Waboy. Thanks, Jeff. Um, fantastic. So everybody, if you have a question for Francis Moore LePay, please press the number one on your keypad, and I will call on you. And when I call on you, please shout out your name and where you're calling in from. All right, looks like we have um, Lynn. Lynn, you are unmuted. What's your question and where are you calling in from? Um, I'm, calling, I'm calling in from Washington, D.C. And um, I wondered if Frankie was familiar with the Young Voices for the Planet films, uh, which are about young people. And what she's saying is really resonating um, because the idea of youth stepping out like these kids in um, – the students in in um, in Miami, in, uh, in in at the Parkland School have. I wondered if she could say something about um, how that 
these young people in, um, you know, from the Parkland school, uh, from Parkland, are are um, causing this whole rising up of young people all around the country, um, and just um, how that can change change the culture. Mm, thank you, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I have been so moved as as all of us uh, that you know since. I, I could have mentioned that as, as about this courageous, contagious theme that gives me so much uh, hope. Is 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 we see it? We see it in that example itself. These young people step up and so with such clarity and such sincerity, authenticity, that then their peers come forward too, including my 11-year-old granddaughter who was uh, marching in New York. So. Uh, I, I really do think that's such a beautiful example of how we're inspired by one another. We that that idea that these, if we see other people taking risks, but doing it in a way with dignity and with verve and with clear thrill, that, that it is a thrilling experience to find your voice. That other people want that, and that's what is missing in so many lives where people feel voiceless and so alone. So, this is a powerful moment. I mean, the numbers. That, that turned out. I mean, it was historic. And so this is this question is right on target in terms of what, what you know, and another theme song of my life, you won't be surprised by this, is um, that it's not possible to know what's possible. And, and if somebody had predicted that, you know, six weeks or whatever it's been after this terrible tragedy, that this dramatic coming together and sign of tremendous energy for progress, if that could all happen with this hundreds of thousands turnout, probably, probably I, I'd say for myself that I would have said, you know, probably <laughs> very small probability. So it proves for me again, and I keep the short list in my head now of things that I would have given very, very small or zero probability that did happen. And, and so I love this motto that I live by, which is it's not possible to know what's possible, so I'm free to go for what I really want. And that is really the the, the spirit I feel of American pro- promise um, that we 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 do not know until we try. And the most amazing things have occurred, which in my lifetime that I would never have predicted. So this is a great example of that. Thank you so much for that wonderful answer. I actually have a question for you. Um, so as people are beginning to meet with their elected officials on lobby day. Um, You talk a lot about um, creating that human connection and making democracy about um, that person-to-person connection. How can a group of people do that when lobbying is usually considered, you know, a very, it it could be very contentious if the two parties are um, on the opposite sides of the spectrum. So how do you bring back that human connection um, to to talking um, with elected officials? Well, clearly, and you know this better than I, that the issues that you're bringing forward are supported by the vast majority of the American people, um, eight in 10 at least. So I think that that the motif or the, the, the theme of, of your coming forward is that you know that you're speaking for the constituents of the people who you are talking to. I mean, uh, that this is not, I mean, this is so clear how Americans stand on this, and the evidence is increasingly clear. So I think that, that, that you know, you show, basically you're showing, re- you can embody the sense of showing respect for the legislator who wants to respond to the constituents who are overwhelmingly in agreement with us uh, that corporate power is over, that is um, is anathema to our democracy, and this is one element of it. So I think just that 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 by body language, by the way you speak, by the language you use, that that really reinforce that idea that you are helping the legislator to respond to the the heartfelt desires and positions of the vast majority of us. Um, that I think that. Is you know assume assume that the legislator wants to behave and think that way. Does that make sense? 
It does. I absolutely love that, helping the legislator. Never thought of it that way. Um, thank you so much. And again, folks, if you have a question, please press the number one on your keypad, and I will call on you. Phyllis, you are unmuted. Where are you calling in from, and what is your question? Phyllis, I think you're having some trouble um, with your audio. Could you speak up a little bit? All right, um, we are going to have to move on. Uh, Kathy King, you're unmuted. Where are you calling in from? And what's your Hi, Sa Santa Barbara. Can you hear me? Yep, you're all set. Yep. Okay, I'm calling in from Santa Barbara. I, I love what you're doing. I so appreciate it. Um, I, I just wanted to mention one thing I've noticed a lot, and that is I hear fighting a lot. We're fighting this, we're fighting that. I just wanted to tell a little anecdote. Um, Mother Teresa had once said she was asked why I don't participate in anti-war demonstrations. And she said, I said I will never do that, but as soon as you have a pro-peace rally, I'll be there. And what I would love to see is that people use wording, words are very powerful, in terms of what we want. And, and use, you know, use those types of words, like what, we, what it is we want to see instead of what we're against. Because I feel like we're wasting energy trying to fight against things. I'd rather see people going for what it is we want and, and just having that, you know, as, as the theme. And the other thing I wanted to mention is I love what you said about the heart uh, clapping. And I had heard someone someone say once that excitement is the opposite of fear. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So yeah, that's kind of a nice way of thinking about it too. It's it's exciting. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, yeah. Also, there's a beautiful book called uh, "An Intimate History of Humanity" by an Oxford professor, who says that the that curiosity <laughs> is the uh -huh. greatest antidote to fear. And I think there's something to that too. That the yes. curiosity of of doing seeing where something is going and and wanting to know if this can work and so but I love your general point about focusing on where the America we want and that's why Adam and I capitalize democracy and movement that we are pro democracy and this is a movement for democracy it's not a movement fundamentally against uh, corporate power or against corruption. Uh, but it is for the deepest values and for the the, the dignity of of every human being to have a voice. Uh, that is our uh, the essence of democracy. So I totally with you, and I try as much as possible. I mean, for example, in in yeah, all of my writing is is much more about the focused on solutions and. So I just couldn't agree more, uh, and, and certainly the language of pro-democracy, that we are part of the democracy movement, um, is, I think, a very, very important way of stating it. Um, and I'm, just lately I've been using the word dignity more and more and um, as something that people, all aspects of the political uh, uh, spectrum can, can, I believe, relate to, it's a word that's hard to define, but we absolutely know what it means <laughs> for each person to feel respected and worthy. And that is another piece of our goal because only as we have a voice and we have uh, know that our voices count, can we ultimately feel that we are considered worthy and dignified. So I, I, I don't know if that's a useful term for you all, but I've more and more been thinking about the power of it to unify people across political barriers. Thank you so much. It looks like we have time for one more brief question. Um, Martin, you are unmuted. What is your question and where are you calling in from? Um, hi, I, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, good. I'm calling in from Silver Spring, Maryland. Uh, I'm sorry, I may not have a very brief question, but uh, uh, I was also marching on Saturday in Washington, D.C., and uh, it was also very inspiring to march with a few hundred thousand other people who felt the same way I did. Uh, the uh, six minutes of silence was 
uh, some of the, the six minutes of uh, the most inspiring silence I've ever heard in my life. Uh, and what I found uh, afterward, the uh, response by the uh, NRA TV uh, to that six minutes was some of the most frightening uh, and uh, just terrifying responses of uh, the, their fear, their anger uh, against Emma uh, and the other, the other kids from Parkland just illustrated how much anger we have to deal with. And this is a time in history when it illustrates the kinds of opposition we're, we're up against. And um, my question really is, you know, when the kinds of lobbying that we are going to be up against, uh, when we have to go up against the, the people we disagree with and who really disagree with us, uh, are illustrated by the uh, McConnells and the Ryans, how are we going to go against them when they're so deeply entrenched in the NRAs and the Mercers and the Cokes? How are we going to deal with that and when they have that kind of anger underlying their entire philosophy uh, to, uh, to convince them to, to, to change, to uh, uh, to go without their their addiction to uh, to money to support their uh, their entire uh, political philosophy. Well, I I think um, I assume that under anger is fear, as you you use that as well, and and um, the antidote to fear is, or the opposite, is hope. And I think that uh, what you all are doing, and this is what I hope that I can, that my life is contributing, uh, it's my goal anyway, is to, to, through your actions, help to multiply hope. I think hope itself is power. Hope is incredibly powerful because that is the fundamental motivation that that is a taproot of, of, um, of our power. So by your showing up, you are giving others hope that, that maybe in that moment you're not dissolving the fear of the person that is now in, in um, angry mode because of his or her fear. But you are giving, you are nourishing the hope in anyone observing you and in yourself which is the most important because that then radiates out. Anyone who touches your life can experience that. So in this is such an obsession of mine right now that hope is not for wimps. <laughs> hope is, 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 is power. And what you're doing multiplies it. So keeping focused on that rather than, you know, the difficulty of dissolving somebody's anger, that anger is coming out of fear. I think is is essential to us, and not let that fear-driven um, anger diminish that hopeful energy that the majority of us, the vast majority of us, are with us and understand um, that that we've got to make the changes that are that you all that you all represent. So. I, if I can't see your face, I don't know if I'm making sense, but um, that that is what I tell myself. Thank you so much for that. Um, Jeff, we're going to kick it back over to you for a uh, final thank you. Uh, thanks, well, boy, and, and thank you for all of those um, uh, insightful comments and questions uh, that came in, and Frankie, for your wisdom and, and grace and, and hope and power that you share with us. Uh, I urge everyone to check out the book, Daring Democracy uh, by Francis Moore LePay and Adam Eichen. It's a wonderful read. It's inspiring. And uh, we're so grateful to have you 
with us and to have you uh, coming back to the National Citizens Leadership Conference in uh, June. It'll be from June 22nd to 25th. And I'll say a bit more about that momentarily, but I'll uh, just let you sign off now, Frankie, and thank okay. you again. Well, I hope to see a lot of you in June, and I just remember how absolutely stunning the conference was when I attended before and learned so much. So thank you so much, Jeff, and all of you. You inspire me. All right. Fantastic, Frankie. Take care. We'll talk again soon. Okay. And for okay. everyone on the call, um, we have our National Citizen Leadership Conference. It, here's some details about it. It's at the Washington Hilton in Washington, D.C., June 22nd to the 25th. We expect 500 to 700 people from all over the country, elected officials, leaders from all walks of life to be there. Last year at our first National Leadership Conference, we brought more than 300 Americans from 40 different states together and uh, work together for inspiration and action across partisan lines. And we expect, as I said, even more this year from all 50 states. Some of the comments uh, from attendees last year, I just want to share with you, uh, they're pertinent to the conversation we've been having tonight. I feel hope and like I know what to do for the first time in a long time, is one comment. And it was a conference like none that I've been to before, and I hope to be back next year. We really came back charged up with a ton of contacts, all with the same passion for restoring our democracy. And thank you for bringing us together and reinvigorating this democracy movement. So American Promise is proud to put on the conference. Um, it's not us that reinvigorates the movement. It's all of us together and all of us coming together for that kind of inspiration. So this year we're going one step further with the Citizen Lobby Day uh, on the uh, Monday, the 25th, the, the last day of the conference. And we'll be providing training, role-playing exercises, a chance to have uh, citizen leaders from various congressional districts in your own communities to gather um, and learn from one another throughout the conference. And we'll have great speakers uh, like uh, Bill Moyers and Nina Turner and uh, Congressman Jim Leach and FEC Commissioner Ellen Weintraub and represent us as Josh Silver and of course Francis Moore LePay and many more. So check out the conference and register for both the conference and Lobby Day. You can see all the details at citizenleaders.us. That's www.citizenleaders.us. So I hope you can join us in June for the conference and the Lobby Day on June 25th. And back to you, Aboy. Thank you so much, Jeff. Um, now, if anybody has questions about um, the NCLC and Lobby Day, um, please press the number one on your keypad, and I will call on you if you have any questions about National Citizen Leadership Conference or Lobby Day. Press the number one, and I will call on you. Um, Susan, you are unmuted. Where are you calling in from, and what's your question? Susan Beckett, you are unmuted, and what's your question? My question is um, why the lobby day is on a Monday when most uh, representatives and senators are back in the district rather than in D.C. where we could meet with them. Great question. Uh, Jeff, do you want to handle this one real quick? Sure. So the, uh, there's a few reasons for that. We're actually um, fairly confident we'll have a large number of representatives and, and, and senators uh, back in the district. Uh, they're in session then. And uh, as you know, of course, uh, many will be traveling back that day. But we do expect to have uh, many there as well. Uh, but the reasons are this. Uh, this is a conference for people uh, like uh, all of us on this call who are coming from daily lives and jobs and um, other uh, things that make a conference on the weekend, frankly, the, the best way to do the kind of uh, training and gathering and inspiration that we need before going up to Capitol Hill to have these effective meetings. So we wanted it to be the third day of the conference so it would uh, have the most powerful in, uh, impact and the most numbers of people coming from congressional districts all across the country. Uh, the other thing I would I would say is uh, the Citizen Lobby Days are not just the one-time chance to talk with your member of Congress. Um, what we really work on is relationship building 
with your member of Congress, your senators, and their staffs. And so we'll hear soon from um, the folks who have done this kind of work in the New Jersey APAs, and and I think um, we'll will tell us a little bit more about that relationship building. But the idea is, if you if, if they're not in, if one of the members is not there for a meeting with their staff people, that's actually quite valuable. And then to follow up when you're back home with your members of Congress after the lobby day, uh, that's very important too, whether you do get a meeting with them or not. So it's a continuum of relationship building to have more impact to uh, get to what we need, both for this constitutional amendment where we'll need the votes of two thirds of Congress, but also to be effective citizens and be represented as, as, we, as we deserve. So it's a great question. There's no perfect time to get hundreds of people up to Capitol Hill. And we uh, decided, and, and after a lot of feedback and consideration from people, that this was the best way to do it. So thanks for the question, though. Great. Um, we have time for one more question, one more brief question. Um, Hank, you are unmuted. Where are you calling in from? And what is your question? It's Hank Mayers, and I'm calling in from Lansing, Michigan. Uh, it turns out that the first question took care of my question, so I no longer have a question, but thank you. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Hank. Well, I'll just say, Hank, thank you for all your great work in Michigan. Good to hear your voice. Awesome. Um, fantastic. And I encourage everybody to go to the NCLC website, which is citizenleaders.us, and you can learn a lot more about the conference, who the speakers are, um, as as they come in and um, just learn more about what this incredible three-day conference is going to be. Um, and the website can also be reached at AmericanPromise.net on the conference tab. I'm now super excited to pass it over to Laura Nittmeyer, who is the leader of the Montclair, New Jersey American Promise Association. Um, and she was first, uh, she was at the first NCLC brought the conference home with her, as we often like to joke, and now is here to share a few words. Hey, Laura. Sure. Hi, little boy. Um, it's true. The The first American Promise uh, conference, when it was scheduled in 2016, I, I was very excited. You know, I didn't think I would know anyone there, though, um, except Jeff Clements, who I had seen speak um, a few times. Um, so I decided to invite a friend that I had met at a march a few years before to go with me. Um, we had been organizing community events on local living and environmental topics in the same uh, meetup group, um, but in adjoining counties. So it was really great to have the time to drive down together uh, from New Jersey, of course, to Washington um, and share um, our rather limited experience with lobbying um, but also with going to Washington, D.C. for, you know, a civic meeting um, versus a tourism trip. <laughs> um, the conference itself, you know, was a big surprise. Not for the inspirational talks, which were pl plentiful, but it was just so fun. Um, incredibly, there actually were people there from New Jersey that I already knew and some that I met for the first time. In one of the sessions, we spent about three hours talking about the elements and the wording of the amendment itself and how every word meant something important and um, had a special meaning that I didn't, that I didn't know anything about. Um, then there were several hundred people from what seemed to be a uh, hundred different organizations, and many of them had very well thought out opinions on the wording too. Um, so I really had no idea the work was so advanced, even at that time, and, and so well developed. The real show for me, though, um, was, I think because I'm in a, you know, a very Republican district, was the conservative and Republican panel discussion in support of the amendment. It made clear in my mind that even though it might be a little intimidating, we really could talk to our congressman, who is who's actually a moderate Republican, about this issue. But we were just uh, really learning how to get started. Now, coming home, um, I really didn't have time uh, to start an APA myself right away. So I started looking for opportunities to support the 20th Amendment work just wherever I could. 
I signed up for the conference calls and all the training I could get. And and little by little, I started going to local club meetings and, and sometimes just shared my view of how important um, this work is. That's it. I just said, you know, at some point I just say, we have to get this amendment and I'm committed to work on it. And, you know, in a very short time, other people asked me how they could work on it too. And ultimately, four of us met with our congressman in just a couple of months. So it's exciting to be going back to the conference again this year, and, and this time with quite a few very committed uh, people, including uh, five members of our local APA. It's fantastic, Laura. Thank you so much. Your actions have been such an inspiration to me and many others, um, including uh, Joan DeVore, who is the co-leader of the Tri-County New Jersey APA and has been absolutely on fire since her group launched last year. Um, so I'm going to kick it over to Joan now. Hi, Joan. Hello. And hi, everyone. Um, and uh, as may be true for many of you, I was not at all politically active before, had never met with a member of Cong Congress or done any lobbying. And um, shortly after the election, I had been connected with Sam Daly Harris via a professional colleague. At the time, I was looking for a way to become active in response to the strong reaction that I had to the 2016 election. I felt that the country was headed for trouble and sitting on the sidelines was no longer an option for me. I brought Sam in for a program at the library at which I work and took to heart his advice that you can be very effective if you narrow your focus to a particular issue or topic that is most important to you because you can only be mildly effective if you take on too many issues. Um, so through Sam, I heard about American Promise, and at the time, there were no APAs in New Jersey at all. And I had determined that I had to focus on, the focus I wanted was the um, most important, where I saw an opportunity, um, uh, uh, and focus on an issue that I felt was most important, and find an existing group for training and support. I felt that issues related to people's votes counting were the most important, and I felt that large campaign contributions and super PACs were taking the power away from the people and that we were dangerously moving toward an oligarchy. And um, so um, uh, American Promise, uh, through Sam Daly Harris, I heard of American Promise and I met Laura and I saw that they offered support from the staff and by working with other grassroots citizen leaders and getting training and the gate would, would empower us to do impactful things. And once I found a partner, uh, that's Marie Hensfelder Kimmel, who co-founded the Tri-County chapter with me, uh, who shared my interest in American Promise. It wasn't long before we launched this chapter. I would never have believed that I could have done that um, a few months before. It was a combination of finding a partner, effective support from American Promise, and training from American Promise National Organization. And now we have an engaged and active team that works very well together, and that is really empowering. Um, these experiences have opened up a totally new area of my life and have been transformative. Um, and to me in a way that I really never experienced before. Um, oh, another thing that Sam has said, and it kind of picks up on where um, Frankie LePay was speaking, he, he, he always says the magic begins when you get out of your comfort zone. And that I've learned through many lessons in life, and that also applies here. I would never have imagined myself meeting with legislators uh, before this, but it's very energizing. So far, we've had in-district meetings with uh, 
uh, Congressman Norcross, who was my congressman, his staff, and Senator Booker's staff. And in the lobby day upcoming in June, we have already meetings set on, on, on that Monday with Senator Menendez in the morning, a member of Senator Booker's staff in the morning, and Congressman Norcross in the afternoon. Uh, so at least two out of three of those that we were targeting will be there on Monday. Uh, now, the legislators that we are dealing with that I've just mentioned are, have all been supportive of the 28th Amendment. So in this case, it's our job to make sure to appreciate their support and to seek and find ways for them to be advocates with us and then leaders and eventually champions for a 28th Amendment. And it's also possible that they may have relationships across the aisle that can be leveraged to build more bipartisan support. And I really thought that the um, uh, the person who, who made that point about talking positively rather than negatively, um, the, the woman earlier in the call, talking about what are you for and what do you want to see rather than we're fighting and against. And I, I, I believe that pretty much any legislator on any side of the aisle would find it appealing to be to be to, to be to think about what could I do more for my constituents if I didn't have to spend so much time fundraising. Um, I think that there's in the heart of every legislator. I want to believe that there's that person that ran for this position because they wanted to do something for their communities. What I've what we've learned in terms of doing this from the, the sort of how to do it standpoint, um, we prepare before before a meeting, um, do our homework, do some research on the legislator or the candidate. Um, when we meet in the district, it, it, it can either be with the um, legislator or someone in their staff. Typically a small team will go to meet in a small, smallish conference room. What I understand from D.C. is that they've got larger spaces so we can, they can accommodate larger groups um, and it'll be a little less intimate but a little more powerful in terms of numbers. So we, we learned that by, finding, by, lear by contacting the D.C. offices and finding out what the capacity of their space is because what we're going to be doing in Washington is um, coming, bringing several people from our team and we may be joining with some others from a team elsewhere in New Jersey, further south, and I'm not sure if Laura's going with us or not. Or, or So um, whereas in district, we're going in smaller groups. And to getting, so moving to getting an appointment, this is where I um, spent a lot of time. This can take time. You have an initial contact. Responses can be slow. Emails and calls not answered. Persist, you have to persist. But as they get to know you, um, they will be more responsive because you're already starting to build a relationship. Um, when we contact legislators to set a meeting, we, we, he, what we tell them is who we are, where we're from, and make sure they know that, that we're a constituent, and who we represent in terms of American Promise, a cross-partisan organization, and what our goals are. Um, tell them what we've been do what what we've been doing as as an American Promise Association because we're really energized, and we're building visibility in the community, and doing things like letters to the editor. And I think that's something that will appeal to them because there's leveraging of visibility there on both sides. Um, thank them if they are a supporter, or thank them for their actions on related things. So show appreciation right there, and try to include some current reference that's relevant to them or their constituents as it relates to what we're doing. And in the request for a meeting, also mention the key things that you want to cover in that meeting and the things that you will be asking of them that they will be prepared. And typically they'll ask you to send them a list of the names of the people who will, who will be coming to the meeting. Um, 
phone calls and emails, phone calls and emails, <laughs> and finally you will get a meeting scheduled. Um, and I was so grateful to get a meeting scheduled in, with one of our senators in D.C. That I, that I accepted their time, which was really not going to work in terms of the way American Promise had it set up. And guess what? We called, and he was willing to reschedule for us and moved from the afternoon to the morning. And, like, that's just sort of something to learn because I was, like, so um, just thrilled to get the appointment that I was, like, not even going to try, and it was really worth trying because once you start interacting with them, it becomes a much more, um, uh, you know, a much more sort of uh, conversational type of thing. Can we change it from the afternoon to the morning? Yes, we can. Um, in preparing for the meeting, it's really great to be part of a team. We got together and we worked out um, an agenda for the meeting. We used some, some templates and outlines that American Promise provided. And we prepped for the meeting and assigned roles. Who's going to take notes? Who's going to do introductions? Who's going to tell a personal story related to the issue? That's important and very powerful. Um, who's going to deal with the specific asks? Who's going to talk about what the next steps are? And so we, would, we met at least once before the meeting to kind of make sure that we were on our game. Uh, we created and get materials to use as leave behinds. Like if we were talking about letters to the editor we could, uh, that we wrote, we could leave them a copy of the letter, um, materials about American Promise, et cetera. And working out what the next steps will be with that legislator or with that staff person, maybe the next step is you're going to collaborate on an op-ed, or maybe the next step is if you met with a staff person, when are you going to meet with the legislator in person? And then, of course, um, uh, so at, um, after the meeting, we sort of sat and debriefed, and uh, then we followed up with a thank you and with a reiteration of what the next steps were. Um, and of course, just um, backing up a second, when, when you actually get there at the meeting, you know, we, we, we talk beforehand, we strategize, make sure we're ready, and get there early and relax because we're prepared. And um, it's pretty amazing to see all of us are new at this. And it's been pretty amazing to see how we've learned to work together, how we've become more courageous together, and how uh, we're getting better at this and we're building skills. And it really has a lot to do with the connections with the national organization our connections with each other and our working together and our preparing together and uh, the training that we've gotten and the support that we've gotten. Thank you so much, Joan. Um, I really appreciate your um, wonderful thoughts. Um, I'm now going to pass it over to our final special guest, Sam Daly Harris, who is the founder of Results and the founder of the Civic of Civic Courage. He led his first Lobby Day in 1984, and he has been to Lobby Days ever, every year since. He's also the author of Reclaiming Our Democracy. Hi, Sam. Hi there. Uh, thanks so much. I was hoping that we'd have some Q&A after this, but we won't have time. In this brief section, my goal is to let you know how committed we are to preparing you to have really successful congressional meetings on Lobby Day. Here's some of what we're going to provide. In late April, we'll have another call like this with a special focus on getting meetings with your members of Congress or their staff on June 25th. In late May, we'll have another call like this with a special focus on planning and rehearsing the meetings with your members of Congress or staff on Lobby Day. In earlier mid-June, we'll have a fourth and final call practice on practicing and answering your questions. During the conference itself in D.C., we'll have two plenary sessions for further training on having successful meetings. We'll have you sit with your Lobby Day groups, have an APA come to the front of the room and demonstrate the first two sections of a lobby meeting, and then we'll have you practice in your Lobby Day groups. After some questions and discussion, 
we'll have another APA to come to the front of the room and demonstrate the next two sections of a lo lobby meeting. We'll also urge your lobby day group to find times during the NCLC, the conference, to get together and practice on your own. If you want to begin scheduling and planning your June 25th lobby day meetings now, here are two steps you want to take. Number one, the first is to find out if someone is already setting up one or more of the meetings. If you're in an APA, be clear about which APA member is setting up each of your meetings. If you're not in an APA, contact Mumboy, and, uh, and I'll give you her email address, w-a-m-b-u-i-g at americanpromise.net, and ask her if there's someone already coming to the NCLC Lobby Day from your community and setting up the appointments, or if you can be the liaison setting them up. The second step is to get the training doc on setting up planning and practicing meetings and study it. Su uh, Susan Muller sent the doc today, so you can check your emails from American Promise today, and it has that six-page training doc. Uh, I've left a lot out, and we've run out of time, but uh, I just really want to thank folks. I want to urge them to go to www.citizenleaders, that's citizen singular, and leaders plural, citizen leaders. Dot us uh, for more information on the conference itself. I'm going to close with something Frankie LePay said. Early in the call, she said, as we march with others from Philadelphia to Washington, D.C. as part of Democracy Spring, we were shouting, whose democracy? Our democracy. Whose democracy? Our democracy. And then the Capitol Dome came into view, and she began to cry. Civil courage, she said, there's nothing more thrilling than doing something you thought you couldn't do. She described her heartbeat quickening when nervous about a challenging action as her inner applause. I urge you all to come to the NCLC to participate in Lobby Day and participate in these calls where we'll start doing more training uh, for Lobby Day. Thanks, everyone. I don't know, well, boy, if you can take all the mutes off so people, people can say goodbye to others around the country? Yep, everybody's on mute. So goodbye, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. 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 Thanks, all. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye